This is beautiful, sunny, and warm Tampa, Florida. Welcome to our continuing coverage of the NCAA championships. Today, Rutgers versus UCLA in the men's Division I soccer final. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Joy, and alongside Seamus Mallon, noted World Cup and international commentator who's been on the mic for nine of the last 11 men's televised championships. This tournament-style format, very much like college basketball, in that the teams survive regional tilts and come down here to Tampa to a Final Four. Yes, indeed, and the tournament selection committee is to be commended because for the second year in a row, they've managed to arrange it that the top four-ranked teams in the country have survived all the way to the Final Four, and now, of course, there are just Final Two. Now, let's take a look at how they got here. First of all, Rutgers did get a bye as a seeded team. Then they beat Adelphi in a shootout. And then they beat Dartmouth in the quarterfinal, and then a terrific battle with Evansville, one nothing victory there, to get to the final. Likewise, UCLA, they received a bye as a seeded team, then beat San Diego and SMU, and had a shootout, uh, a grueling shootout, with NC State uh, in that semifinal match. Well, now, Rutgers won in regulation. UCLA had to survive both, both overtimes and the penalties very late in the day. With the finals coming just one day after the semis, will Rutgers be a fresher team? I think Rutgers will be a fresher team. Tremendous burden has been placed on UCLA. They've come across three time zones to get here. They've played a grueling semifinal match, and uh, critically, I think uh, they will be exhausted emotionally and physically as the game wears on. And UCLA will be missing a key player. They certainly will. A terrible, terrible tragedy for senior Ray Fernandez yesterday, who lost his cool, uh, punched uh, an opponent, and was ejected from the game, and therefore must sit out the final. But still, Seamus, there's some top talent here. Oh, there's great talent here. UCLA has always sent players to the national team. Chris Henderson is one of those. We'll see him today. But also keep an eye on Kobe Jones, a very short player, but maybe one of the fastest players in America. And Rutgers, for their part, will be countering with Steve Rammel, who has been in three Final Four games, has never scored, would love to do so. And the big shock, Lexi Lalas, their top defender, who played such a great game in the semifinal, will not start today. We just found this out a few minutes ago because he's recovering from an illness this season, and the coach feels he cannot play two 90-minute uh, games in a row. There is no day of rest between semifinals and final, and that's going to pay its toll today. Well, this great pool of talent has also attracted a star search of sorts. Let's join the third member of our broadcast team, Jim Gray. Okay, Mike, thank you very much. We're here with Otar Osiander. You're the 1992 Olympic coach in Barcelona. Who down here might make the team? Well, there's about seven players we're looking at, and we're inviting them in for a January training camp. And so after the camp, we'll know more who will be on the qualification team. Sneaking up pretty quickly, isn't it? Yes, it doesn't take long to get there, yeah. Okay, also joining us up here is Bob Gansler, 1990 World Cup coach for the United States. You'll have that position again in 1994, at least all indications are such. When do you start preparing for that? And can you assess our chances, or is it just too early? Well, we've, we've started as soon as the, uh, the World Cup was over in Italy. We start on the next one. Uh, exactly what our chances will be, uh, a little too early to say, but I think a realistic expectation is for us to make it into the second round. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. We'll be back with the lineups in the start of today's championship game after this. As the State University of New Jersey faces UCLA for the men's soccer championship. Seamus, let's have a look at the lineups. Well, first of all, the Bruins are coached by Siggy Schmidt, who has taken his team to eight consecutive NCAA tournaments. And the team itself plays a 4-4-2 formation. Four defenders, four midfielders, and two attackers in front of their goalkeeper. Brad Friedel, a transplant from the Midwest, and now a U.S. Olympic team prospect. In front of him, four defenders, two on the flanks and two in the center. First of these, Tate Ayani, one of eight Californians in the starting 11. Jorge Salcedo from a well-known soccer family. Dan Beeney, who'll be the last line of defense. And Mike Laffer, injured for all the regular season, but back for the playoffs. In midfield, a very important part of soccer is winning the ball in midfield and attacking from this position. So there are four skillful players here. The first of these, Kobe Jones, very fast and accelerates quickly out of midfield into attack. Joe Max Moore, highly regarded nationally, although only a freshman. Sam George, the Iron Man of UCLA midfield. And Chris Henderson, he was on the U.S. World Cup squad in Italy. And up front, two forwards. These are the men that everybody depends on to get the important goals for victory. First of all, Mark Sharp from Palos Verdes, California, unheralded, but an important compliment to Billy Thompson, the leading scorer for UCLA with 18 goals. 
Bob Riasso is the coach for Rutgers. He has led them to national prominence primarily with in-state players. Now, Rutgers will use a 3-5-2 formation in front of their goalkeeper, who is Bill Andraki. He's had an exceptional season, 12 shutouts and 19 starts. Three defenders for Rutgers. Starting on the left side with Chris Beach, an aggressive and tenacious defender from Long Island, New York. In the center of the defense, Jeff Zahn, who has moved there from midfield. And on the right side, Mike Miller, a defender, but he can play just about anywhere on the field. In midfield, Rutgers will flood this area with five players to try to win the ball early from UCLA. Pedro Lopes is very speedy, and he will probably match up against Kobe Jones. Brian Santowski, he hit the winning goal against UCLA in the regular season. Mo Mazzocchi, a surprise starter in midfield in the absence of Lalas. Dave Miller, generally regarded as the maestro of the Rutgers midfield. And Jeff Carstens, he scored the goal against Dartmouth to get Rutgers to the Final Four. And up front, the two men who are going to have to do it all for Rutgers. First of all, Lino DiQualo, very skillful on the ball and a good improviser. And Steve Rummel, the leading scorer and one of the nation's most respected strikers. Well, here are our experienced officials crew today. They'll be enforcing important rules, such as the difference between direct and indirect free kicks. The indirect free kick must touch another player before it goes in the goal to count. The penalty area is the large rectangle in front of the goal, and if a defender commits a foul there, a penalty kick results. Now, the clock is not controlled by the sidelines, but by the referee himself. He's the only person who can stop it. And the substitution change this year means that a player who leaves the field cannot return to play in the same Don't period. Don't anywhere. You are the greatest soccer team in America. It's time to prove it to everybody. You're not number one off twice. You ain't been number one yet. Only Coach Bob Riasso talking to his Rutgers squad, who try to extend their unbeaten streak to 12 straight games. In this championship tilt. Quieter over in the UCLA huddle. As a result of the coin toss, Rutgers will defend the goal to the right side of the screen in this first half, and they'll switch ends, and Rutgers will kick off. What can we look for, Seamus, in these opening minutes? Well, the opening minutes, I think each team will try to uh, have a little possession, uh, not really go into full-blooded attack, but try to win the ball and get it back to their own players so that they can touch it around, get a feel for it, and uh, in that way sort of establish themselves and get a sense of comfort and maybe even get it back to the goalkeeper, as we see here. Now, this very often is seen as negative, and it is negative at times. Fans boo it because they don't like to see the ball being passed back to the one player who can use his hands. Uh, but on the other hand, you do want to bring him into the game. You do want him to get a touch. Uh, and then when people have uh, sort of got the feel for it, then you can look up for the attacking opportunities. UCLA trying to set up and get something going in this first minute of play. Rutgers on several occasions this season have scored in the opening three to four minutes. So a very explosive team from the start. That's right. And in fact, in UCLA's first game this season, they gave up a goal in the first 30 seconds. Now, that was against UCAL Irvine. They came back to win that game 3-1. But it was indicative of some of the rebuilding that they were doing in the defense. Uh, in fact, using three freshmen uh, and a sophomore in the back uh, five, if you include the goalkeeper. Nice save there by Friedel, who at six foot four has a basketball player's reach. Well, he is a freshman, too, technically, although he was redshirted last year. But he is really an impressive young man. As you say, very tall, terrific range and reach. And also, I think, uh, symbolic of the very good young goalkeepers that American soccer is producing these days. Chris Anderson on the ball had a score or an assist in each of the Bruins' first five games this year. And Rutgers right back with it before it reaches midfield. Anderson controls scoreless so far at Tampa in the men's national soccer championship. We'll be right back. And my head to handle this ball. I also have to use my head to handle my problems. To stay in control, use your head, not drugs. If scoreless in the first half, UCLA is in white moving from left to right. Rutgers is in red as UCLA tries to bring the ball up past midfield. Jorge Salcedo working with Thompson here. Salcedo to Thompson, and he overruns it. Rutgers rejects the ball and sent right back by Joe Max Moore. And Mueller with a very nice pass 
for Rammel. And here's Rammel chasing the ball, looking for help. Back to Dave Mueller, the senior midfielder. And Chris Beach coming up from the defense. And away it goes. Well, a poor clearance there by UCLA. They should have done better with that. But what a nice combination play uh, by Rutgers. Mueller showing why he is indeed the maestro of midfield with that lovely flick. And Rammel shielding the ball very well when he was played to him with his back to goal. And that's the kind of skill that Rammel has uh, shown all season long as an attacker. UCLA sets up the defense. Brian Santowski, the freshman, crossing for Rammel, who settles it and may have a chance here. And he's high. Very good chance to score. He's going to regret that one later, I think. Let's go to Jim Gray up in the stands with the Rutgers band. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. We're here in the middle of the Rutgers band. Usually 52 members strong. Today, just 10 members are here. The Rutgers Woo! athletic department at the last moment decided to send this group out, and they're here to kind of cheer their team on and play a little. Are you rah, rah, are you rah, 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 Rutgers, rah, upstream, 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 rah. Jim, I only see two instruments. Uh, is that the band or maybe it's the Rutgers chorus? <laughs> UCLA is on the attack. Bring it up the near sideline. Mike Lapper ahead for Kobe Jones. Jones taking it to the corner against Karstens and the cross. Taken by Rutgers. Handball. Yes, a handball by Steve Rammel. He wants to make believe that he trapped it with his shoulder, but you're not going to fool Vinnie Morrow that easily, so uh, it's very definitely a handball, as we'll see from the replay here. He reaches out his left arm, and there's the infraction of the rules, so a direct free kick now for UCLA. Chomax Moore boots it, and Andraki is right out there. Well, he dropped it a little bit, but uh, that ball was swerving away from him. He had to come get it a bit of a distance, uh, and happily for him, just fumble it into an area where there were no UCLA players. And Drackey will punt it away. <laughs> UCLA trying to settle. Today's winner will be but one of several NCAA college soccer champions. In men's soccer, Southern Connecticut State and Glassboro State winning their divisions. And in women's soccer, Ithaca, Sonoma State, and North Carolina repeats as Division I champ. And here we see their sixth goal in a 6 nothing rout of Connecticut in the final game. Their eighth championship in the last nine years. What a juggernaut Coach Anson Dorrance has developed down there. And he's also the national women's coach for the World Cup. NC's win coming after Connecticut had upset them in the regular season, ending a 103-game unbeaten streak. But our congratulations to all the champions. As UCLA is on the attack, here comes Thompson into the penalty area. Jeff Zahn rejects it across the goal line. Substitutions, Ibsen in for UCLA, and here's Alexi Lalas for Rutgers. One of the members of last year's team that made it into the Final Four, but not to this championship round. This morning, you know, you're thinking back a year ago to the position that we were at a year ago, going into a semifinal game against Virginia and uh, losing, you know, pretty badly. We, we, did, we put on a good show, but, uh, you, you know, now we, we, we're over that hump, you know. It was always like getting back to where we were. And now we've gotten back and we've gotten even further, so we might as well take it all the way. <laughs> Well, Lexi, one of the most skillful players in the Rutgers team, and also one of the most relaxed players, like especially his ability to throw the long throw-in, which is actually more accurate than the kick-in from the sideline. He is six foot three, and he gets a lot of arm on the ball. UCLA trying to reject it. And finally cleared out of the penalty area. DeQualo, nope. <laughs> right back the other way. And here comes Thompson, the senior and three-year letterman. Waiting for Henderson, speeding up the left wing. Henderson against Chris Beach. Brings it across the goal mouth to Ibsen. Cross in the air, and Beach is right there. Uh, no handball call. Back it goes, and Andraki is up and with it. Well, you heard some of the UCLA players yelling handball there. The ball, I think, did touch his hand, but uh, it was unintentional. It came off the ground, and the referee is not going to uh, call a handball like that when it's not intentional. Salcedo booms one up and over the goal. Had an opportunity, but 
Very good chance for Salcedo here. He sees all of the goal and just miss hits it. So again, close, but still no score. We'll be back to Tampa after these messages. Teams, the United States fielded the youngest player, 19-year-old Chris Henderson of UCLA. The year prior, Henderson saw action in the Youth World Cup in the Middle East, finding the ball and the net with this score. How do you get to be this good? Play and practice all the time and start young. At age four, here's Henderson, number one, playing against six-year-olds. For more, here's Jim Gray. Okay, Mike, I'm here with Dick Henderson. His sons, Chris and Sean Henderson, play for UCLA. Another son, Pat, played for San Diego State. Chris was the youngest in the World Cup in 1990 at 19 years of age. What, are your kids just dribbling a soccer ball out of their crib? Oh, they played a lot when they were younger, and uh, it's interesting. Three years ago, we were, the younger boys were watching uh, their older brother, Pat, play in the NCAA Finals at Clemson against Clemson for San Diego State. And now he's here watching the two younger ones play for UCLA, so we've been pretty lucky. Yes, you have. Quite proud father. Let's go back upstairs to you, Mike. Chris Anderson wears number 14, former high school national player of the year. And this is Henderson with the cross. Rutgers knocks it away. Boy, nobody able to settle the ball. Gallegos. And now back to Chris Henderson. A little dribble pass. <laughs> Players calling for the shot, and again, Rutgers rejects it to Qualo. UCLA coming right back, and Karstens boots it away. Well, there we saw some very good action by Chris Henderson. Watch him here now. Watch the position as he traps the ball into space away from the defender so that he can run onto it and dictate the play and get this very high-quality volleyed cross in. That's a very difficult technique, and he did it really perfectly. Now, here's another skill. He's a right-sided player here. He's approaching his defender who's thinking right foot, right foot. Now, watch the left-footed pass that fools the defender and sets up his teammate. Kobe Jones will throw in. We've seen Henderson come up both the left and the right wing. Rutgers trying to clear the ball out of that penalty area. Gallegos. That's time remaining in the first half, and it's going to roll out off Rutgers. UCLA inbounds. And there's Rommel with the ball. A little fancy footwork as he works well in the crowd against Henderson. And Henderson, looking for the ball, found Rommel instead. Well, Henderson shown up a little bit there by Rommel stealing the ball away from him. He didn't like it very much at all. Showed his competitive side by going back and uh, sending Rommel a message with that foul. And senior Dave Mueller will put the ball in play for Rutgers. That's Miller. Back to Mueller, back to Miller, back and forth. Well, they're just looking around to see if some players up front can get free and therefore swing the ball from one side of the field to the other and try to uh, pull UCLA defenders out of position. Chris Beach looking ahead, marked by Ibsen, number 17 for UCLA. This is Beach, and Kobe Jones breaks it up. Thompson trying to settle the ball. Brings it up. Well, foul committed there by UCLA, but uh, what a good break by Kobe Jones out of the back and finding Thompson. But Thompson's pass was once again hurried. Tom Thompson just seems to be off his game today. He's really rushing things, not finishing with his usual customary cool, and that pass was an example of uh, a bad decision on his part. Miller calls to Qualo back for the ball at midfield. Qualo. Ahead for Rommel and rejected by UCLA out of bounds. Miller to take the throw in, and he'll leave it for Lallis. Alexi Lallis. Boy, that shock of red hair is an easy target when he's on the field. DeQualo settles it. Playing with it a bit, and a bit too long. UCLA kicks it away, and a whistle. Well, DeQualo dispossessed there. He was uh, man-marked by two players and therefore is a uh, bit ambitious in trying to spin away from the sideline and two defenders. Nearing the end of the first half, a long ball past the end line, and there's Andraki, and he could double for Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> He's got that same kind of int intensity and the same look. 
Well, he's an intimidating goalkeeper, too. He, uh, he commands a lot of respect, both for his ability and for his leadership. We hear him a lot ye yelling at his players where to go. There you see him right there, giving very sharp, firm commands to his teammates as to what he wants them to do. And players like that. They like a take-charge goalkeeper. And Drackey punts it. Looking for Lawless, again, that easy target. And here's Steve Rommel. Rommel trying to control against Lapper. Shakes him, sends the ball to his left to Mueller. Santowski is there if he can spin and fire. Santowski right into the arms of Friedel. Well, he did everything well except the final uh, piece. And that was a lovely piece of play indeed by Rutgers, starting off uh, with Rommel's uh, very good skill in turning the ball and taking it away from Lapper and setting up the combination play in front. Now that's what Bob Riasso would like to see more of from the Rutgers team, working the ball down the side and then good, sharp passing in and around the penalty area and getting the shots off. Unfortunately, the shot really was not a high quality one. Time in the first half will expire without another scoring opportunity. So after 45 minutes, no score. Friedel with two saves. For UCLA, Bill Andraki with three saves. Let's go to the Rutgers sidelines. Here's Jim Gray. Okay, thank you, Mike. With me, Coach Bob Riasso. Bob, your thoughts on the first half here, scoreless tie? Well, we started out well in the first 10 or 15 minutes, and then we started losing our shape a little bit. We weren't tracking well enough up front, allowing their backs to have too much of the play. Uh, UCLA took it to us the last 15, 20 minutes. we got to go back in the locker room and sort it out. Well, what's it going to take to score in this ballgame? Well, we just, I think we could play for, uh, Steve Rammel's feet and Lino's feet earlier, or we'll get a chance to get some goals. Okay, good luck in the second thank half. You. All right, let's go back upstairs. Chris Beach walks off to join his Rutgers teammates in the locker room. The United States is looking forward to hosting the World Cup Championship in 1994. During halftime, we'll take an insightful look into the state of the sport in this country and its future right after this. Welcome back to Tampa, Florida, where UCLA and Rutgers have played a scoreless first half, but Seamus, perhaps the best half we've seen in this Final Four. Well, this half had a lot of action. The fans here are very excited. Tremendous goal mouth action indeed. And uh, I think that if this keeps up, we should see some goals. America's soccer program. Some great talent here as a result of a great youth program and a strong college game, but then what? Well, American soccer, I think, is very much now at a critical stage in its development. Yes, we went to Italy in the World Cup 1990. We did okay. But we host the World Cup in 1994, and sports fans in general are going to want to see a better performance from America's athletes. How we develop those players to perform then, that's a big question. Some tough decisions have to be made right now, and there's a lot of controversy about those decisions being made. The U.S. participated in the World Cup for the first time in 40 years, and while Germany left with a trophy, the Americans learned some hard lessons on what it's like to play at this level. The three losses in three games has raised a few questions indeed about the team's preparation. No one else in the world has successfully prepared a team for the World Cup without having a professional league. And we have used stopgap measures in order to do that. The major problem is that American college soccer uses Americans playing American style. Uh, at the World Cup level, which is the level that the U.S. wants to get good at, that style doesn't really make it. When we start talking that a mature player is 22 years old, we're kidding ourselves. That's a kid. That's a young player in most other leagues. For us to, to wish that we could do it the European way or the South American way, I think, is, is counterproductive. Uh, I think uh, the, co the colleges have served other sports well, and they should be able to serve uh, soccer well. The NCAA has proposed some rather stringent rule reforms, the most disturbing of which is the banning of play on outside clubs during the academic year. The fact that a player cannot play outside of school during the academic year is downright illegal. And I don't care what the NCAA says, that is an infringement of a player's rights. Uh, and it's probably, if the truth were known, a violation of the National Amateur Sports Act. If all those limitations go into, into effect, uh, then it will virtually stifle the development of the top quality uh, soccer prospect in, in the United States. Talented players will go try to find another context. Maybe they'll go to school in their spare time and play either in a professional league here, if there is one during the bulk of the year, or in uh, some other country. As of right now, guys like myself and guys who are playing in Europe at the moment, 
it's tough for them to stay here because they want to make a very good living out of the game, just like any professional does. Until we develop a professional league of high caliber in this country, uh, I think we're going to depend on the colleges to develop our top players to compete in international competition. To their credit, the U.S. did well, losing only one nothing against Italy. But it's obvious that the pace of the game is simply above our level. The question remains, how do we close the gap before the next World Cup in 94? I think the World Cup in and of itself in the United States will do very well financially, will do very well at the gates, and will definitely draw a lot, a lot of attention to soccer. The key question for soccer development in, in the United States is what will be left after the World Cup comes and goes. Seamus, it seems that 20 years ago, soccer was just on the verge of being the next great American sport. Have we gained much ground in two decades? Well, I think we have gained quite a bit of ground. There's, uh, of course, a great increase in participation, but really what we need is an increase in the level of uh, expertise. And really, it may be asking too much of our colleges and universities to provide that for our players, indeed. They may need a pro league or pro experience overseas. Uh, furthermore, the new regulations which are being proposed by the NCAA could have a devastating effect uh, on the progress uh, of American soccer players in colleges and universities because their abilities to play outside the universities in good amateur leagues is now being eliminated or could be eliminated by these new rules. If that happens, then there's no question but that young, talented players will have to bypass colleges and universities and go on to play professionally either here or in foreign countries. As Rutgers and UCLA come back to the playing field, we'll be back with the second half of the men's NCAA soccer championship. After the field awaiting the start of the second half as UCLA huddles up. Well, let's listen in. First five minutes, let's go. First five minutes. Hey, you to tomorrow. three win. One, two, three, win. There is no tomorrow, the sentiment in the UCLA huddle. Likely the same conversation going on on the Rutgers side. Rutgers defeated number one ranked and previously undefeated Evansville in the semifinal round to reach this game where UCLA beat North Carolina State to advance. The Rutgers band cheering on their team as we get set to begin the second half. They have switched goals. UCLA will defend to the right side of your screen and be facing the sun as they kick off. Chris Henderson sends UCLA on the attack quickly. Thompson to Sam George in the corner, crossing and out of bounds. And already we see the same style being established in the second half that we saw in the first half from UCLA. That is looking for opportunities down the wings, trying to break players uh, down the sides. If it's not Henderson or Jones, then it's going to be somebody coming from the back. That time it was George breaking free. And uh, this is one thing that Rutgers is going to have to watch out for, those players who suddenly come out of unfamiliar positions to take up wide attacking positions. Out of bounds off UCLA. And Mike Miller, who carries a 3.8 grade point average in economics, will throw in for Rutgers. Back to Miller. Looking ahead, controlling is Rommel. Rommel. Coming across, finds Sentowski, who unloads, and it's high. Here's Jim. Okay, Mike, as the national championship game goes on behind us, every sport must have its future. And the future is right here, as you can see. Now, when I was a kid, growing up, we used to play a lot of sandlot football, touch football out in the streets. But now, all across this land, the thing you see more and more is recreational soccer. That's what the kids are playing. And how smart are these kids? Well, they came all the way to the national championship to get their education. Let's go back upstairs to you. Yeah, but how smart are they? They bought a ticket and they're not watching the game. <laughs> Friedel puts it in play and a whistle and oh, I, I've fallen down and I can't get up. <laughs> was that the death scene from Hamlet? Well, that was uh, Chris Beach getting into a tangle there with Mark Sharp and Mark Sharp didn't hesitate to, to hit the deck as fast as he could. I don't think Beach really did that much damage, but let's take a look at it. There you see uh, he just sort of flings an elbow around, catches him on the Arm and down he goes. Sure, Sharp saw the official right there, wanted to make sure he went all the way to the carpet so it'd be a foul. Yellow card on Chris Beach. Yes, the yellow card is out. That's a warning on Chris Beach. He's got to be a little careful now. He's a tough defender. It may take a little bit out of the uh, aggressiveness that he's used to playing with. A similar situation in the UCLA semifinal game yesterday resulted in one of their star players being ejected. 
Yes, watch Ray Fernandez here in the blue uniform punch his opponent from NC State in the stomach. He goes down. He got a red card for that. He was ejected and misses the final. I think it's sad for Ray. Uh, soccer's an emotional game, and I think at that point of the game, emotion got the best of him. Uh, it's something that he, he has to live with now. Uh, whether the penalty of having, uh, in addition to having to sit out the game that you were ejected from, sitting out another game, uh, whether that penalty is fair, uh, I've always been a believer in the long run that that is a fair penalty. And so UCLA will play without Fernandez. And that's a tremendous loss for them, indeed. Uh, and the question really is whether there was consistency in those two decisions, the one we just saw uh, in today's match and the one in the semifinal, which resulted uh, in the tough blow for the senior Ray Fernandez, who could not play in the last game in his collegiate career. We are scoreless at Tampa, Florida, the men's Division I NCAA championship. And here is UCLA on the attack and a nice slide tackle by Karsten. Well, Carson really saved the day there on Kobe Jones, and any time Kobe Jones gets back that far, a, a player like Carson's coming out of midfield has really got to turn on the Jets. Well, Carson's is the quickest on the squad. He runs the 40 in 4.35. Corner kick for UCLA. And Drackey definitely feeling he was obstructed on the corner kick. Well, let's take a look at a replay of this corner kick. You'll see two players from UCLA making a diagonal run towards the near post and the ball. Another player looking for space in the middle. Uh, that's Lapper, who's a tall player. So the first two players might be a bit of a decoy or distraction to the defense. Here the ball swings in. It does clear them and opens up space for both Salcedo and Lapper. Lapper gets the shot and goes by. And take a look at this as Salcedo and Andraki are tangled up as we see it from another angle. Their arms interlock there, and that's what Andraki was so upset about and was letting uh, referee Vinnie Morrow know it in no uncertain terms. Coach Bob Riasso didn't look nearly as upset as his keeper was. Well, I think Bob believes a great deal in maintaining composure uh, in his own disposition as a coach uh, because that's what he wants his players to be able to do. So uh, no need for an overreaction at this uh, crucial point in the game. UCLA trying to move it ahead. Tim Gallegos looking ahead down the right wing, and here comes Thompson. No, off the post and over. Two clear chances for Thompson. He and Miller are both on the ground. Well, Thompson can't believe he missed it, but look at this man, Miller. He's cramping up, and that had a key role to play in that chance for UCLA. As we take a look at it in the rebound, now look at this very first, first touch by Thompson. Good back heel there. Now watch him run into far space as Gallego sets up and watch as Miller tries to catch him and just can't get close to him. And the chance for Thompson he does well putting it under the goalkeeper but then it hits off the post and the rebound he just can't put it away. It is heating up here in Tampa and we'll be back right after this word from your local station. Less than a minute to go in regulation. Siggy Schmidt yelling at his UCLA Bruins to get something going in this final minute. Yes, and he wants his attacking players to get right into the penalty area, get way up front, and let Friedel hit a long ball towards him. They're not going to worry too much about midfield passing at this point. They want to take the most direct route to goal, and that's right down the middle. UCLA with the ball, looking for a last-second shot to salt this championship away. Here's Chris Henderson, and it's kicked away and whistled dead. Well, Jeff Carson's doing a good job one-on-one -on -one against Henderson there. Henderson forced to foul him, and that's what the whistle for is for. And time will run out. No score at the end of regulation play. And Jeff Carstens will get a well-needed break before we begin the overtime rounds. There are two 15-minute periods of overtime, and whether or not there is scoring, we'll play both 15 minutes. If we're still knotted up, we go to sudden death. A maximum of two 15-minute periods. And if we are still tied, penalty kicks will determine the outcome of the national championship. 
play each other's feet now. We don't want to play long balls at the space. Make the game easy and play each other's feet. You want to still find Lino, stay as far forward as you possibly can. Matter of fact, Lino, why don't you, what I want you to do is hang up on the deepest man. Okay, you just go up and hang up on the deepest man. Whenever possible, just like Lapper and Joe did that one time where Lapper took over Lawless and you took over Lapper's man. That's got to happen. <laughs> All right, and that's got to happen all the time, okay? A bit of sideline strategy as Bill Andraki goes back into goal for Rutgers. Seamus, what do you think? Well, each team trying to neutralize an important strength of the other. Rutgers uh, wanting to push their forwards right up on the last defender of UCLA so that uh, they don't make it as easy for UCLA to advance from the back. And UCLA, on the other hand, trying to be sure that they don't uh, get outgunned in the midfield and that a player like Lalas and his players around him are marked carefully and picked up uh, by the midfield of UCLA. This is what we talked about at the top of the game, really, uh, and still very much the theme of the match. Alexi Lalas playing hurt. He's had intestinal trouble, and they've been draining uh, the excess fluid. He'll go under the knife at the end of the season. He's playing now like he's 100%. Mueller fires. Nice save. Rita. Tremendous save by Frito, and look at the, uh, the confidence just emanating from his play. He really uh, has no worries whatsoever about this. He moves to it nicely. Good steal here by Lawless, and a very nicely timed pass. He lets it go there, and Mueller settles it nicely, touches it once, and then whacks it up to the far corner. A couple of steps first by the keeper and then the great dive but what really makes the save is the fact that he took two little short steps quickly and then had to and was able to leap for it after that Friedel is six foot four and he needed all of it on that save UCLA clears it away Beach upended as Chris Henderson takes the ball down the left wing crosses High and out of sight is Billy Thompson once again. Well, Henderson, there's Thompson looking in disbelief, uh, which is something he seems to be doing a lot of in this game. His team has fared well, though, in overtime games. They've not lost, neither is Rutgers, but UCLA with five overtime wins this year. This is the first of two overtime periods. As Mueller brings the ball right side for DeQuello, back to Santowski, Lawless coming in, and Sentowski unloaded. Well, Sentowski can really whack him from long distances. He has a reputation for doing that in the regular season. He burned UCLA, had a goal against the Bruins in Rutgers' victory earlier this year. And that was a close call for UCLA. Well, Brad Friedel was concerned about the space to his left. The defenders do not close in, and he's got to worry about that space. He moves a little bit towards his left. But then look at number four. He really saves the day. Dan Beeney getting a nice deflection there with his head over the top, and the referee didn't even see that, but it really could have been curtains for UCLA had he not uh, touched that one over the top. Jeff Zahn sends it up the wing for DeQualo. DeQualo looking in toward the goal area. Beats his man, puts it in the air for Lawless. Hits the bar with a header. Still the ball not settled, and it's up again. Lawless up, and he and Friedel fight for it. And Friedel has had enough of Lawless there. <laughs> well, two nice boys from the Midwest, Michigan and Ohio, mixing it up a little bit in front, but no harm done. Let's take another look at it here on the replay. A tremendous challenge in the air by Lawless. Gets his head on the ball. Can't believe it himself as it comes off the crossbar. Goalkeeper definitely beaten that time. What a great chance for Rutgers. Couldn't convert it. And then the rebound. Back into it. Here you see them tangling. And Lalas goes down. And Friedel gives him a little nudge and a few words of advice. Looks around to see where the ref is and then decides to maybe to back off. And a little pat on the shoulder and a little pull of the red locks as he pulls away. A <laughs> <laughs> little bit of a psych job going on. Lalas is easy to spot out there. Here is Rutgers coming right back with it. Brian Santowski working the ball. Henderson comes back to help out. Mike Lapper. And finally, they work it away. Clearing the ball as we run out of this first overtime period is UCLA, and we still have no score in Tampa, Florida. We'll be back with a second overtime.
No set pieces. When you get a chance to get around the box, shoot from a distance. Fellas, everybody is tired right now. The game is going to be won on a mistake. Stay on your feet, concentrate, stay with your mark, don't make mistakes. That's why I brought those fresh guys on so we can play more. Well, talent is uppermost and strategy right there, but it sounds like both coaches would rather their teams be lucky than good at this point. Uh, you always need a little bit of luck when you get to the NCAA playoffs because it's a knockout competition and, uh, um, you know, every team can come up with that one big game. Uh, but I think, you know, this is maybe the year for us and, and the ball's bouncing right. Well, Seamus, we're into the second overtime, still scoreless, but we've eavesdropped on some very important and very differing strategies. Well, it's interesting. Bob Riasso is telling his players not to do things that their bodies may, in fact, encourage them to do, which is to make mistakes uh, and to do sliding tackles when they're ill-advised and therefore be in a bad position. You don't want to leave your feet. He keeps telling players, don't leave your feet because then you give up a chance to the opponents. The UCLA coach, Ziggy Schmidt, is saying, let's make the game as easy as possible for ourselves. Don't make extra work. Do the simple thing. Do it well. And don't run yourself to death. Thompson with the ball. The Bruins leader in career game-winning goals, but he needs to find the right range here. And it gets knocked away. Had a chance. Well, we talked to Billy Thompson earlier, and he's been at UCLA for five years. He told us he wants nothing more than to win this national championship. It means everything to him. And maybe he's just trying a little bit too hard. He's had some great chances and has not been able to put them away the way he's been able to in the regular season. All right, good effort, come on! Corner kick, UCLA. And Drackey lining up his squad. Joe Max Moore sends it in. Gallegos had a chance before it's knocked away. And here's DeQualo trying to get something going for Rutgers. Jeff Zahn, and Zahn has been all over the field in these two overtime periods. He and DeQualo trying to work the ball ahead. Dave Mueller. Mueller beating Paul Ratcliffe ahead for DeQualo. On the left wing, Sean Henderson marking DeQualo, Chris's younger brother. Hey, watch the Where's he going? Cross Wallace with the header. And Friedel was right where he wanted to be. Well, if Billy Thompson can't buy a goal at the other end, Paul Wallace <laughs> can't buy him at this end because this time he's again in a great position, gets the header in, but this time heads it down to the ground rather than uh, towards the crossbar as he did before. And unfortunately, he went down a little bit too sharply and was an easy save in the end. And a lot of credit to Lalas for getting into that fine position. And top marks to DeQualo for beating a double team situation and getting in a quality cross. In this second overtime, we have so far played to a draw. This game looking much like the Karpov Kasparov World Chess Championship. <laughs> yeah, but I wonder how their moves look on instant replay. <laughs> well, it's not so instant. Lalas up for the header, but it's whistled dead. Yep, foul by Lawless as he reached in to push his opponent. And a quick free kick uh, taken here out to Henderson. That's Chris Henderson sending the ball ahead back for Henderson. Henderson coming in, overruns it. And Chris Beach ends up with the ball for Rutgers. Now there you see uh, Rammel losing the ball. Now that's not the kind of a pass he would have lost in the first 90 minutes, let's say. But, but he's tired and his concentration is going a little bit. Normally, he would have had no trouble retaining that pass. That Jeff Karstens throws in for DeQualo. Karstens looking for Steve Rommel, number 20. Rommel trying to settle it. Rutgers is 21-0 in games in which he has scored. Yo, Matt, stay to Steve. Rommel has DeQualo, but it's blocked out of bounds by Mike Lapper for UCLA. It's Dave Mueller to throw in. Getting down to the final minute of this second overtime. Mueller and slide tackle and out of bounds again off the foot of Mike Lapper. Well, a throw in here, but they're obviously waiting for Lallis to come over and take it. But valuable seconds are ticking down on the clock here. Sure, there's enough time to score, but in soccer, it's unlikely you'll score right off the first header from the throw in. And you want to be in a good position to get a couple of chances off the rebound. So they've lost a good 15 seconds here on this opportunity. Lawless can fire the ball. It'll resemble a corner kick coming in, in the air, and nobody from Rutgers could get near it. Trying to settle now. Ooh, that had to hurt Mike Miller. Lawless sends it. It's high, and Friedel is there. 
If that ball floats into the goal area, he is going to be there for it. It comes all the way back to Andraki, who just sets it down and lets the clock run out. Well, in the final four, UCLA has yet to score a goal. They won their semi and penalty kicks, and now we go to sudden death. After 90 minutes of regulation and 30 minutes of overtime, still no score. This whole college season is going to come down to one good kick. Well, it's exhausting for all of us. It's exhausting for the players, and it comes down to this sudden death, which is very, very tough. They have two 15 minutes of uh, overtime now, sudden death. So the minute a goal is scored, it's all over. If they don't score in 30 minutes, then it goes into the dreaded penalty shootout, which is also a heck of a way to settle the national championship. And if UCLA wins that, they will have won the national championship without scoring a goal. Sudden death overtime is next. We've had the opportunities. They've been there. All we have to do is stick it in the back of the net, boys. One shot. Listen. One shot. One goal. And we all go home. Bob Riasso, Scarlet Knights, fell to Virginia in last year's semifinal round. He started the season with one goal to play in the title game. We banded together this year saying that that was our goal, this is what we want to accomplish. And one of the great things in life is when, and that's one of the reasons why you coach, is when you can uh, bring your people together and dedicate yourself to achieve a goal. And they've just done a tremendous job for us, and it's very gratifying for us. And also, uh, for our university, Rutgers University has not won a lot of na national championships, uh, different than UCLA. And we would like to bring home their first national championship. As the day goes long, so must the endurance of these players. Well, it certainly is true that the, the critical qualities now are just that. Endurance, physical and emotional maturity, and trying at all costs to avoid the fatal mistake that you have to live with for a year. What about mental endurance? Very much, I think, almost more important uh, than physical endurance because concentration is really what it's all about at this level of play. The players are skillful enough, talented enough that physically they're okay, but mentally uh, they may not be ready for what the demands of this uh, is throwing at them, especially with no day of rest between semifinals and finals. Dave Mueller will take the corner kick for Rutgers. A ball in the net wins it. It is sudden death and sudden championship for one of these two teams. Rutgers in red, UCLA in white. Here's Sentowski bringing the ball down the left wing, crossing, and headed up by UCLA. Joe Max Moore off his chin, but he controls the ball, brings it down. Lopes defending. Down goes Moore, and he tried to take part of Lopes' jersey with him. Well, Lopes is upset, too, uh, about that. The foul's been called against him, an indirect free kick. You see the uh, right arm raised, indicating indirect uh, for obstruction by Lopes. Battle of the two freshmen, Lopes, the New Jersey High School Player of the Year last season. And a product of St. Benedict's High School in Newark, New Jersey, where Tab Ramos played uh, his high school ball. And he's now, of course, one of the best United States World Cup players. Tate Ayani sends it out of bounds. And Lawless to throw in. What's this? Well, it looks like the referee's going to give a bench warning here for some unsavory comments probably about the referee's failure to call a foul uh, against UCLA player Beanie when he did the same thing pulling the shirt of Rammel. Well sometimes the ref's in position and sometimes he's not. Exactly. Gallegos settles for UCLA and drops it back for Sean Henderson. That's Ratcliffe getting ridden off the ball. Nice play there by Lopes. Dave Mueller for Lawless and Sentowski knocks it out of danger. <laughs> A little late on the whistle, perhaps. Well, Sentowski unhappy here because he did not feel the entire ball was over the entire line and uh, that it was still in play. Billy Thompson on the ball, tries to work it through and gets tripped up by Jeff Zahn. Well, what's the call here? This is right at the edge of the penalty area. If it's inside, it's a penalty. If it's outside, it's just a direct free kick. But uh, referees usually pull these just outside the area. Let's take a look at the replay and see what it shows. Here are the lines of the penalty area. Now, is it inside or outside? 
Watch him as he spins away from his defender, Mizoki. Mizoki grabs his shirt. He falls down as he is hit, but he's hit just at the line, maybe outside, falls into the penalty area, and the referee, I think, makes the right call. It's a free kick outside. Six-man wall for Rutgers. Joe Max Moore. And it's blocked. Almost back to midfield. Dan Beeney tries to send it in. And Bill Androcki makes the catch. And will he punt it away? Trying to send his team down, give him a little time. And that's all he has is a little time in this first sudden death overtime period. Androcki punts it away. But Rutgers no chance quickly to capitalize. And UCLA keeps the ball in the air. Time will expire on this sudden death period. And we are still scoreless in the national championship game. And here are two of the big reasons why. Bill Andraki in goal for Rutgers. And Brad Friedel, the netminder for UCLA. 15 minutes of sudden death overtime played, 15 to go. Now, I know this is not a big scoring game, but it's not a scoring game. No, I don't know if scoring is a science or an art or whatever it is. It's eluded these two teams. UCLA clearly having the better chances. Now it comes down to kind of a freak. Something can happen, a mistake, a bad bounce, and all of a sudden you've lost the national championship. So 15 more minutes, but it's sudden death. Could be over any minute. So scoring has been a lost art thus far. One more chance of it on the clock. Florida playing for the National Collegiate Soccer Championship. UCLA and Rutgers still scoreless. Mike Joy with Seamus Mallon and Jim Gray. A goal will win it. This is the last sudden death period. If we are still scoreless at the end of this, we go to penalty kicks to decide the title. Lalas with a boomer. Way high. Not a good shot, as Bob Riasso shows by his reaction, but uh, he can't complain about Lexi Lalas. He's given him everything he could. Nor can UCLA complain about this man. He's had a tremendous game. Here's Henderson. The ball way up in the air. Thompson with a header. Here's Ratcliffe. Ball to Andraki. Well, of course, UCLA has been in this situation before, Mike. Uh, in 1985, they were in the championship. They went to eight overtimes before they won by one goal to nothing. So that was uh, almost as long, if not longer, than this particular event, which is not necessarily to recommend it by any means. <laughs> no. The, the rule since changed to limit sudden death overtimes to two. In last year's title match, Santa Clara against Virginia, they played two sudden death overtimes and declared co-champions on a very cold day at, at Rutgers University in New Jersey. A chance, Ratcliffe crossing and headed away by Lalas. Well, that's why, uh, that's why Lalas is so important to this team. He makes chances at the other end, but then he does his defensive work. He comes back and uh, frustrates the opposition's coach, Siggy Schmidt, thinking that that really was a great chance. Corner kick in. Lapper settles it. Lalas marking him. Cross to Ratcliffe. <laughs> and Drackey breathes a sigh of relief. Well, and his teammates should be grateful to him as they are. A terrific touch over the top by Andraki from this great imaginative back here by Ratcliffe, um, which was really a very <laughs> enterprising piece of play this late in the game. Ratcliffe snatching the ball from midair. He and Brad Friedel at the other end have both played tremendous games. They have so far been the heroes, but one could just as easily take the brunt of the loss. Should a ball slip through, it's all over. Chris Henderson, the header to Gallegos. Here's Ratcliffe again. Another chance to cross high and over the end line. Well over. Not a good finishing cross by Ratcliffe, uh, who had a great chance a minute ago to put his team uh, on a nice plane trip home. And we're going to take another look at that because it was a really spectacular attempt. Here you'll see the cross come in for Lapper. Now take a look at Ratcliffe as he spins away from the ball to his right. Look at his right foot. See the little back flick there with his heel. And Andraki has to react very late to it, but does so and tips it just over the top. So a wonderful reflex save. But here again, look at this low angle. A great little back flick there. Very, very clever. And Andraki just managing to claw it over the top of the goal. And Ratcliffe making the ball while Jeff Zahn was taking his feet out from under him. 
Rutgers trying to get something going. Penetrating. And the shot is just wide. I don't think Friedel touched it. I don't think so either. That was awfully close to the post. Nicely set up by Rammel, too, by the way, who made a very nice pass into space to set it up as we see the shot at the end by Lopes. But look how close this is to the post. Just misses. Just misses past the post. Friedel didn't touch it, but he had his hand covering anything that could have gone in the goal. Well, it's an example of his terrific reach and his diving ability. He did have it covered, but what a, give a lot of credit to Lopes for that very, very accurate shot after so much soccer today. And Racky comes out of the penalty area and has to kick it away. Steve Rammel leaving it for Dave Mueller. Mueller with the follow on his right. <laughs> Couple of jukes fakes and now the follow. The follow move toward the corner and leaves it. Three UCLA defenders right there. Right. The three defenders coming over. They know the danger man. And here comes danger now by UCLA. See what Sean Henderson can get going in the final 30 seconds of play. Kobe Jones, marked by Chris Beach. Near the end line, cross, and it goes off Beach and out of bounds. Joe Max Moore for the corner kick. Crossing. <laughs> and Drackey didn't even come out for that ball. Time running down. Henderson may have one last shot. Out of bounds and out of time. Bill Andraki out of breath. His players and those of UCLA out of endurance and they'll have to regroup to settle this national championship on penalty kicks. All you gotta do is make a couple of bubbles, say the rest. Here's your order. Lino, Rammel, Mueller, Mazzocchi, Beach. That's your first five. Lino, Rammel, Mueller, Mazzocchi, Beach. Second five. Meyer, Lala, Zdowski, Lopes, and Carson. We'd played two and a half hours of nearly non-stop soccer. Now what? Now we go into the dreaded and somewhat controversial shootout where each team designates five players. They go into the center circle, they wait their turn, they go forward, they take penalty shots, each team alternating until they've taken a, a total of five, and whoever's ahead after five rounds uh, is the winner. If they're tied, they go on to round six and see if that breaks it, round seven, until somebody misses and the other team scores. So it's, we'll go to breakfast if necessary. Could very well be. It's been a long day of soccer, but somebody will go home with a national championship. The designated players head for the center circle. One at a time, they will alternate taking shots at the opposing goalie. One shooter will go home a hero, and one goalie will have to stand for the loss. Well, Rutgers has put their two big guns in the number one and number two spot, and over on the UCLA side, the big surprise, their leading scorer, Billy Thompson, is not even in the top five. UCLA freshman keeper Brad Friedel talks about his strategy defending against the shootout. The shootout, I feel, he should wait. I mean, you get five chances at it. You should be able to wait it out because one kicker out of five usually, most likely, will miss hit a ball. Lino DiQuello, the team's second leading scorer, will be the first shooter for Rutgers. Look at the reach enjoyed by Friedel. DiQuello's in the net. Friedel got a hand on it. Couldn't bat it away. Well, despite what he just told us, he seems to have moved before this shot, going to his Same left, George and uh, DiQuello just UCLA. simply knocks it down the middle. The UCLA coach thinks that Andraki went to school on his shooters in the semifinal. Was Andraki taking notes, and what is his strategy to defend the shootout? What I do is I try and read the kicker as much as possible. Um, if he doesn't open up, if he squares his shoulders off, then I'll, I'll go one way. But with this level, at this level of play, you can't wait for it to, to react. you got to try and pick a corner to go to.
but well they should celebrate and Andraki clearly moves here in fact before Sam George even hits it he's already on the way to his left an easy save in the end for Andraki and a bad penalty indeed by Sam George senior Steve Rammel is far and away Rutgers leading scorer his 17 goals include five game winners a great chance for UCLA to tie it up. Joe Max Moore is going to be the next shooter. He is tied for the team lead with 10 assists and six of his 11 goals this year have been game winners. Moore sends it straight to the corner and that evens everything up. Well, that's exactly how you take a penalty kick. The perfect example of Siggy Schmidt not showing any signs of relief yet. Senior midfielder Dave Mueller will take the next shot. The third high scorer for the Scarlet Knights this season. So shocked here because he now realizes that uh, with a score tied at 1-1, UCLA has three chances left, and Rutgers has only two. Well, Mueller doesn't even come close on this shot, just drills it way off target, and that really is a stunning turnabout. Now look at him lean way back and therefore get under the ball and put it way over the target. Uh, surprising uh, failure of technique by such a skillful player. Tim Gallegos, the junior midfielder from Albuquerque, comes on to face Bill Andraki. And Draki guessed, and he went the wrong way. Well, and Gallegos made it look very easy just pushing it up to the upper corner. It's not as easy, frankly, as he made it look. But uh, now UCLA very much in the driver's seat with a 2-1 lead. Senior Maurice Mazzocchi is the fourth high scorer for Rutgers this season. And this will likely be the final shot of his college career. Mazzocchi takes a risk here hitting it high against a tall keeper, but he gets away with it as Friedel can't quite knock it away. And it brings up Chris Henderson, who was on the 1990 U.S. World Cup team, fourth leading scorer this year for UCLA. Well, he's learned a few things from his World Cup experience. That penalty shot was simply unstoppable. Chris Beach, a senior, headed for med school after graduation, and one of this team's co-captains. Chris Beach keeps Rutgers' hopes alive. Well, look at this one. He keeps it nice and low. Now, the goalkeeper does move, does get a touch on it, but because he keeps it well and low, a tall goalkeeper such as Friedel is not able to get down quickly enough to the corner to knock it away. So freshman Jorge Salcedo can win it for UCLA. second national soccer championship and while the Scarlet Knights of Rutgers played well it will be a long ride home let's join Seamus Mallon with the champions okay thank you very much Mike and here we are obviously with the champions and let me talk to uh, Siggy Schmidt here Siggy you your guys had tremendous chances to score 
during overtime, during regulation, and uh, all those missed chances, were you beginning to get that sinking feeling that it was going to get away from you? Yeah, I was beginning to think it was sort of like 85, that we'd never score in a title game. But uh, I thought today I was pleased because we played a lot better than we played last night. I thought we played offensive soccer even though even though we didn't score any goals but uh as as the game went on and we didn't score yes i was getting frustrated what about having to play two overtime matches two days in a row uh, that too could have uh, contributed to a bad mistake by one player here and there and lose the championship what do you think about that definitely and my team always hates me when we do fitness and things like that but i think they realize uh, over these two days that uh, that it's probably the extra work that we do on fitness and the hard work that we do at training and their hard work and diligence that paid off i mean there's no way team can come back and play that amount of minutes in two days as we did and not be a very fit team so they they deserve a lot of credit well it also takes a little bit of skill in the end you got to have a bit of skill and a little bit of composure and we're going to talk with Jorge Salcedo here who has both of those qualities <laughs> at the right moment Jorge tell us a little bit about uh, just about how you approached the kick and what was going through your mind at that time well to tell you the truth I um I usually go the other side and um I was hoping the goal would fall to one side and he did and I just hit it the other way Winning this title has never been easy. In 1985, UCLA played eight overtimes to win it. Today, the shootout decided the national champions. Seamus, it's a strange way to decide a title, the winning team not scoring a goal in regulation or timed overtime, but this won't take any of the luster off UCLA's championship, will it? I think not. Uh, they know the rules. They know the uh, challenge that a penalty shootout involves. And, uh, you know, it does call for qualities of composure and balance and that kind of thing. And when, uh, when you're going to be a champion, you have to have those qualities. And in the shootout, they showed it, so they're deserving champions. It's been a tension-filled afternoon and late evening of college soccer. For Jim Gray and Seamus Mallon, I'm Mike Joy congratulating UCLA, the 1990s. Very important one. And he was dying two or three years later.